Thanks uh, to the organizers and the Institute for inviting me. Uh, this talk is somewhat different from the rest of the talks. Um, it's more analytical in nature rather than, say, combinatorial, as many of them. Um, and it's about strong data processing and the entropy power inequality. Um, maybe some of you know what strong data processing is, but from Chandra's talk, but if not, I'll just review it. So the basic idea is that if you're given a joint distribution x and y, and you look at two random variables, OK? So if you choose any channel that takes y to v, basically what that gives me is it gives me a Markov chain, x to y to v. So v only depends on x through y. And if I look at the joint range of the mutual informations, i, y, v, versus i, x, v over all such channels, then basically I'm going to get some shape that looks like this. OK. And why does the shape look like this? Well, it's convex because if you take two channels, I could always just time share between them. Or you know, we used one channel with probability lambda and the other channel with probability 1 minus lambda. So it's certainly convex. And why does it lie below this line with slope equals 1? Well, uh, the reason for that is because traditional data processing inequality tells us that this guy is less than or equal to this guy because of this Markov chain. right? OK, so um, let's see. So Chandra talked a little bit about this um, hypercontractivity. Basically, what that tells us is there's a line here with some slope s star, which is strictly less than 1. And this curve lies below here. But it, what's of interest, I guess, is to characterize this whole curve. Or if we could, then what it gives us is it gives us a really kind of fine trade-off between these two mutual informations. And why are we interested in Sorry, such? Yeah. OK. OK, so basically, here's, here's the idea. So you're given x and y joint distrib jointly distributed, right? If you take a channel that takes y to some new random variable v, that'll induce some mutual information i, y, v, and some mutual information i, x, v. I could measure those two mutual informations just between these two pairs of random variables for that particular channel, right? And I could put that as a point here in this plane, i, y, v, i, x, v. OK, so that's what I'm going to get there in just a second. So the joint range of those dots over all such channels traces out some set, right? OK, so now what might be of interest is this upper boundary on this set. And it's kind of the ultimate data processing inequality, or quote unquote strong data processing inequality. Because what it tells us is that if I think about this function being g parameterized by t, basically this y-axis, then what it tells me is if I knew this function g, I would always have i x v less than or equal to i, sorry, g of i y v. A function of the joint distribution, exactly. So typically, why we are interested in such a thing is because we have control over this channel here, right? So we have control over this mutual information, but we want to bond this one in some non-trivial way, OK? Right. So you're, you're describing, I mean, this still doesn't make sense to me. So is p parameterized by t? Is p parameterized by t? Because as you change t, you're changing the value. What's the function? This number does not just depend on the it depends on t, right? No, no, no. So, by the so here we have the joint range of these mutual informations. So for each, for each channel that you choose, so for each v, it basically is going to give me some point in this region. For each channel. For each channel. The channel is just. The channel also determines these numbers i. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it'll give me some point, a pair i, y, v, and a pair i, x, v, right? And so I could take the union of all such points. No, but for a different channel, you get a different point. Yeah, yeah. For a different channel, I get a different point. I take a different channel, I get a different oh, so point. It's the whole possible channel. Uh, yeah, it's the joint range. It's the, yeah. There's also a lower convex boundary to it. So it's not the whole region. So it's actually a. Uh, yeah, OK. So, so fine. This was it depends. For the channel that we'll be interested in, it's, it'll be the whole line. But this anyway. Is, this is the corner image of the set. 
Right, right, right. right. This uh, image characterization. So, yeah, so like I mentioned, basically if I take two different channels, I could flip a coin and use one channel with probability lambda and uh, the other channel with probability 1 minus lambda. And basically that'll give me a weighted combination of these mutual informations, right? So. What's that? No, no, no. So this is a function of the distribution, right? A mutual information is a functional uh, of a distribution, right? So basically, you're given this, and then you get to select this channel, and that gives me a joint distribution on P, X, Y, V. Yes. Okay. But why, for example, then it seems that this, this information is always bounded by the entropy of, of V. So it should some have some right, the yes. right boundary. Yes. Then. Okay, but uh, but I could always take v to be you know some something entropy y entropy y is an entropy y is an upper bound. But okay, so fine. For discrete variables, for discrete variables, I'm thinking in terms of continuous variables for this talk. Think of them as being Gaussians or something like that. In which case, the the shape will look exactly like this. You're you're right though. If if we're looking at discrete variables, we'd have some set that looks like this. Go up to h y. Okay. Anyways, just trying to convey the... So the these are arbitrary. The second channel is arbitrary. Yeah? yeah, yeah. Basically, what you get to do is you get to choose this, right? It gives you one point in this region. So, for example, there is a point where it's identical, yeah? Point where it's identical. When the second channel just copies V is equal to U. Yep, right, yeah? exactly. And that would give me this point here. H, Y, comma, I, X, Y. Y this is not decreasing. What's, uh, is it clear or unclear? Okay, so, fine. I think the confusion is that if, if, if y is continuous, this, this point goes to infinity, and that's why you have a curve. Right, right, right. Talking about continuous, most of, most yeah, so for most of this talk, I'm going to talk about continuous y. So y with continuous distribution, in which case, I, uh, this curve goes off like that, and basically, it'll look exactly as I drew it originally. But for now, fine, think about it this way. Um, okay, so the talk is about that. <laughs> okay, so strong, I didn't realize uh, it was gonna take so long to get through that, but, and the entropy power inequality. So the entropy power inequality is in, a, in an inequality about the sum of, uh, or the entropy of sum of random variables. So if I take a random variable x with density, okay, and a random variable y, also with density, I add them together, then what the entropy power inequality tells me is that the so-called entropy power of y, now h x is minus, where f is a density of, of x, okay? So what it gives me is it gives me a lower bound on the entropy of the sum, essentially, right? So this is like Shannon, 1948, Stam, uh, 1959, Blackman, 1965, I think. Um, but anyway, so the point of the entropy power inequality, it's uh, kind of related to Brun-Minkowski, actually. That's one way of thinking about it, because you can think about these entropy powers similar to volumes of sets. Uh, but anyways, the point is, is that it's kind of the only I would say useful inequality in information theory that doesn't follow from something like chain rule or whatever. Um, yeah, so anyways. So entropy power inequality is pretty fundamental inequality in information theory, but also um, elsewhere. So what I want to talk about today is how these two things are actually connected, or how we can connect these two things. So the, or the original motivation now We'll leave that up there. So the original motivation for this talk is, well, this is a seminar or a workshop on distributed computation and distributed communication. So let me just mention a few kind of uh, distributed computation problems in information theory, which have started receiving interest also um, elsewhere. So the quote-unquote CEO problem 
is one like this, where basically nature produces a random variable x. And this random variable is observed through conditionally independent channels. Okay, by different uh, observers. And kind of the goal here is these guys, I observe my random variable y, and what I get to do is encode it and transmit my message or my encoding of this random variable at a specified rate. So rate one, rate two, so on and so forth. Rate m, and let's call the encoded functions just f1. F2, Fn, and kind of the goal in this scenario is there will be some decoder who observes these encoded observations, so just a few bits from each person, and tries to estimate x. Okay, so this is the so-called CEO problem introduced by uh, Berger, 1996, but there's got to be like I don't know, 100 papers or something on this problem. Oh, noisy value, right. So maybe just think about corrupting x by Gaussian noise in each of these cases. So what I do is I observe a noisy version of, say, this value selected by nature. And then my goal is to encode my observation. It's like a distributed estimation problem, essentially, right? So I observe some noisy value. Alex observes some other noisy value, you observe some other noisy value, and then we all send succinct messages to Bobak, who then from our messages will try to estimate x. But the point is, is that we know the joint statistics, so we should try to take advantage of that so that way we don't uh, produce too much redundant information in our, in our messages, right? What's that? This, I'm just trying to represent the channels. And uh, this says product PYI given x, so it's conditionally independent channels. So this is the, the channel that x is being sent through. Right. OK, so this is that. And then typically in an information theoretic setting, what we do is we observe n independent copies of x. So then basically this channel looks like this. Say it's a memoryless channel. so. It's like each kind of observation gets independently corrupted. And what I try to do is I try to estimate the entire sequence. OK, so that's one such problem. OK. Then the other problem, kind of multi-terminal, of kind of fundamental interest, I guess, is another distributed computation problem where two different terminals observe correlated random variables. So now x, y have joint distribution p, x, y. OK. Correlated random variables. They both encode their observations at particular rates. Rate r, x. Rate r, y. And the goal of some decoder is to produce an estimate of x hat and an estimate, or an estimate of x and an estimate of y. OK, so again, we typically take independent observations and we try to code over blocks, like in the traditional information theoretic setup. And so kind of, what's that? Now there's no noise. We observe correlated observations. So I observe coin flips, and you observe correlated coin flips. OK, but then we know that they're related. We independently encode our observations and send them to Alex again, whose job is then to try and estimate my sequence and estimate your sequence. But if he wants to estimate our sequences losslessly, this problem is completely solved. If we want to reduce our rate a little bit, say you know I'm only allowed to send one bit per second or something like that, then maybe it's just fundamentally impossible for Alex to produce our estimations or our observations losslessly. And so what I'd like to control is something like the distortion or the loss in his estimation should be something like constrained in some way and similarly for y. So what's the goal of the encoding to reduce the Yeah, so the goal in these settings, so similarly we would we want for y. We 
less than or equals some constraint dy. And here, the goal would be x, x hat n less than or equal to some d. So again, they're all distributed estimation problems, subject to, you can think about these complex, as complexity constraints in the descriptions that I'm allowed to supply. OK, so what is the goal here? That's a good question, because I guess we've got a mixed audience. Um, goal in these problems, understand fundamental trade-off between rates ri and allowable distortions di. OK, so that's the thing. I, like Alex wants to recover both of our sequences of bits uh, and only get like on average 10% of them wrong. How many bits do we have to send? Right? And so that's the question. So this is kind of like uh, Shannon's you know, channel coding problem, for instance. Uh, you know, if I want to send the message losslessly and recover it with vanishing probability of error, what's the maximum rate that I can send, so on and so forth. OK, so what do we know about these problems? This is kind of the tutorial part of the talk that we were instructed to do. So uh, OK, so what's the, what is known about these problems? So what is known? OK, so for the CEO problem, OK, actually, answer, question, answer, virtually nothing. OK, and I say that because for most choices of channels, loss functions, joint distributions on XY, we really don't have anything be besides what would be considered like elementary bounds. Um, so typically in information theory, we look for what's called an inner bound and an outer bound, an achievability result and a converse result, meaning that we show the existence of a scheme that can achieve some rates and distortions. And then also we'd like to show impossibility that no scheme exists that could do better than that. So for these type of distributed problems, most of our traditional techniques break down. Um, so for these two problems in particular, let me tell you what is known. OK, so virtually nothing is an is a overstatement here. It's just for, for dramatic effect. But uh, I mean, we do know quite a bit about these problems. But for the CEO problem, if x is Gaussian, or let's just say normal 0, 1, y i's equal x plus wi, wi. So basically, if x is Gaussian, in this case, and I observe Gaussian corrupted observations, and d, let's say x, x hat, equal x minus x hat squared. So basically, what this says is that if I'm considering jointly Gaussian sources, and I want to recover under mean square error. So the way that I measure my distortion here is squared loss. So this is just like a traditional minimum mean square error estimation problem, except for I've got these funny distributed constraints, right? Then, OK, solution known. OK, and basically it's a sequence of a few papers. So one, Uhama, uh, 2005. And then to uh, Prabhakaran et al. Uh, 2004. So basically, these two papers solved it independently uh, around the same time. And technique is just to apply the entropy power inequality, essentially. Um, OK, so the reason why I mention this result okay, is because there's been a series of recent papers, and particularly a community that maybe intersects with what's here. So for instance, um, Braverman, Garg, uh, Guyen, uh, oops, Ma, Woodruff. So this was. 
just as last year, for instance, they invented this problem kind of from scratch, uh, arrived at the same problem, and they consider basically the, the same question. Like, OK, suppose that there's some underlying parameter. We'd like to estimate that from Gaussian corrupted observations. How do we do it? So there is connections between, I think, what people are starting to become interested in and what would be considered maybe the more the CS community and what's been studied in information theory community. Yeah. Yeah, so typically that's usually what we look at, yeah. But even in this case, they do consider the dimension growing, yeah. Yeah. When you say the solution is known, do you mean the complete region? Yeah, the complete region, the explicit trade off between the rates and achievable distortions. Okay, so fine. What else is known here? Okay, so for multi terminal problem, okay, again. Uh, quadratic loss x y jointly Gaussian okay x y jointly Gaussian then it's completely solved and this is Wagner et al uh, 2008 there's actually a series of about three papers um, that led up to a final solution for it. Mm. OK, they use the CEO results and uh, plus Uhama, 1997. So my point is, is that for this problem, even in the case where we're measuring these guys are distortions under squared loss, and these guys are jointly Gaussian, so a very special case of the problem, it was introduced, I mean, people started looking at this in the early 70s, and it took 35 years until it was completely resolved. And it was a series of like three or four papers that ultimately built up to the solution. So it's quite, uh, quite a feat, kind of. This last paper by Wagner, which put the last piece in, pace, in place, was kind of a tour de force. Um, OK, so virtually no other settings completely solved except arbitrary distribution under log loss. I'll explain what that means in a second. And that was a few years ago by myself. And Saki Wiseman. OK, that's 2012. So what do I mean by any distribution? I mean, now we're allowed to have arbitrary distribution of x, y, OK? Or x distributed arbitrarily, but now these channels also, you know, I can pick my favorite channels. There's no constraint to be Gaussian or whatever. And so the question is, what does log loss mean? It's very clear what. Uh, you know, reproduction subject to a squared error constraint is, right? That's just MMSE type of estimation. Well, log loss essentially comes down to a mutual information constraint. So what it says is that I want to be able to reproduce my observations such that they reveal a certain amount of information about the original sources. I, Y, and then similarly here, this would become I, X, N, X hat N, greater than I, let's say X. So now instead of constraining my reproduction to be within a certain distance of the original source, all I want to do is reveal a certain amount of useful information, a certain amount of bits about my source. And the question is, how should I do this? And it turns out what's very surprising, I think, is that we can completely solve these problems, get the exact trade-offs between the rates and the information that I can reveal for arbitrary source distributions. Okay, um, So that kind of begs the question. It's like, what's so special about mutual information? Um, and for those of you who know, if I consider Gaussian random variables and I look at mutual information between two jointly Gaussian random variables, it's in one-to-one -one correspondence with the mean square error uh, based on the best estimator of, of one given the other. Um, so it seems like, in fact, that the Gaussian cases 
should actually be a special case of this where I reveal a certain amount of information about uh, the original sources. And it turns out that that is the case. It's not um, super easy to see. But this is kind of where the motivation comes from because, you know, when I proved this result, I realized, hey, you know, the only problems that we can solve are these Gaussian cases, which feels a lot like revealing information about the sources rather than trying to do some actual estimation. And so maybe what we're good at in information theory is just manipulating and quantifying the tension between information measures rather than you know, actually doing the estimation part. It turns out that the estimation, I think, was, was a little bit of a red herring. OK, so anyway, that's kind of the, the motivation for this. Wow, and I've used up half hour already. OK, so here we go. So where does this stuff come in? So that's kind of the information theory part of the talk. Now we'll talk about fundamental inequalities. OK, so if I look at the m equals 1, or 1 encoder CEO problem, then what I'd have is I'd have some observation, or kind of what nature produces. This would give me what I observe. And then my job would be to encode this at some particular rate, such that a decoder can reproduce this guy in a way that reveals some useful information about my source. Okay, So it turns out that in this particular case, ri is achievable or feasible, meaning that for a given rate r, I can reveal i bits of information about my source if and only if exist v such that x to y to v i x v greater than or i equal to i, i y v less than or equal to r. OK. So basically, what this is saying is that this region looks exactly like this here, right? Does that make sense? So basically, the answer to this problem, if I constrain the rate at which I'm describing my observations, and I want to know how much information can I reveal using that number of bits, OK, it corresponds precisely to this kind of curve here. So it's maybe not a surprise that strong data processing is somewhat important. So all of the so-called converse results, or the impossibility results in information theory, even though, I don't know, it's kind of like a black art, really, deriving one, um, kind of what happens is you ultimately, through a series of manipulations, you get down to some quote unquote strong data processing result, which shows you how you're able to control one mutual information in terms of another. So kind of the goal here would be to you know, have some framework or some ultimate uh, yeah, statement that, that could tell you how or what the tensions are between various mutual informations. And then what you would be able to do is um, somehow give very nice lower bounds for, for problems, things that are beyond our reach right now. OK, so basically, the point here, main point, instead of focusing on, quote unquote, operational problems, meaning problems like the ones that I just erased, we should maybe on fundamental inequalities between mutual informations or entropies. Because if I understood the tensions between these mutual informations, then somehow what it would do is it'd provide an answer to this series of problems. Okay, um, I guess that's a little bit vague. So let me now, that's the motivation part. Now let me get to some math and show you actually what we're able to say. How are strong data processing and uh, entropy power inequality related? OK. And then I'll show you. OK, so it's known that the entropy power inequality holds 
if and only if x and w are Gaussian. So let's just take a slightly special setting. So let x just have arbitrary distribution, but w be independent in Gaussian, uh, sigma squared, OK. Then what we have is this result that 2, 2, h, y, OK, y equals x plus w to the 2, h, y minus i, uh, x, v greater than or equal to 2, 2, h, x minus i, y, v plus 2 to the 2 hw for all v such that x to y to v. OK, so this looks really complicated, but let me explain what's going on. Basically, what we have here is we have the entropy power inequality, but what we have is a correction term. So this correction term cor corresponds precisely to the points that I'm able to get in this region. So in particular, I could rewrite this as 2 to the 2 hy minus uh, g t greater than or equal to 2 to the 2 hx minus t plus 2 to the 2 hw. So the point is, what I'm able to do is if I had this curve here, I could trace along it at different points. If I understood the trade-off between these mutual informations, I could trace along it and induce corrections in these exponents and potentially make the EPI tighter. So think, let's think about what happens. If I were to vary t in that picture over there, the right-hand side might start at 2 to the 2 hy, and the left-hand side would be 2 to the 2 hx plus 2 to the 2 hw. OK? But as I vary t and g of t, what's going to happen is maybe these curves are going to come a lot closer together. Does that make sense? Basically, what I've got is I've got the entropy power inequality. But what I can do is I can decrease both of the exponents here. But this exponent is left unchanged, right? So even though I decrease both of these exponents and these two terms decrease on the whole, this term stays the same. So you ultimately kind of tighten the inequality. OK. So that's the basic idea, is that we can tighten the entropy power inequality if we understand uh, strong data processing. So now let me show you some applications of this. So I didn't see Villani's talk, um, when was it, uh, last week? OK, I don't know if anyone else saw it, but he does a lot with entropy. Um, one of the major things that they use is something which information theorists know as Costa's EPI. It just says that entropy power is concave. And so what Costa's EPI says is that uh, 2 to the 2 x plus alpha w greater than or equal to alpha squared 2 to the 2 um, h x plus w plus 1 minus alpha squared 2 to the 2 h x. OK, so this is Costa's EPI. So this is actually quite a fundamental result. Um, like I said, it's been rediscovered in several places. Uh, Costa is one, but then Basically, this concavity of entropy powers was rediscovered in literature on functional inequalities, but now it's known that they're the same. Um, so the original proof of this was fairly complicated. But let's see how we, we could recover this from this guy here. So can recover immediately by taking x just as itself, y equals x plus alpha w, and v equals x plus w. 
in this, and then just basically do some algebra and you recover Costa's API from this guy here. So the point here is that this strengthening, we're allowed to choose any channel here. And this result, which is kind of acknowledged as fundamental result, uh, this concavity of entropy powers, what we see is that it's a special case of this when this channel is restricted to be Gaussian. Okay? So in some sense, this result that's been known around since uh, 85, I guess, it was only providing a small piece of the picture because we were only seeing that, you know, okay, this concavity of entropy power holds, okay, but then basically what we can see is we can adjust that channel to be anything we want. Okay. Um, let me give you another example. So for the, yeah. So this concavity is also known if x is Gaussian, w is not Gaussian. You only need one of them to be Gaussian. Only one of them needs to be Gaussian, yeah, right. So can you recover the other one from here? Uh, I should be able to. I, I haven't tried it, but it should be possible, I think. Let me think about it afterwards. So another application. OK, so now what happens is this guy also has a vector version, n, n, n over n, n over n, w. And also, if you're familiar with EPIs, there's something called conditional EPI. So if I have a new random variable q, then what I can do is insert conditioning in there, provided that these guys form a Markov chain condition on Q. OK. And what's another application? So application two, or example two, is consider again this problem, which took 30-something years to solve as xn, yn. We've got some, I'll call it f of xn g of yn are the encoding functions. OK. So it turns out that uh, can recover converse immediately. Uh, mean square error with or by identifying as f x n, OK, g of y n. So basically what I do is this problem that took something 35 years to solve, it really was, you know, basically the converse result was just eluding us because we weren't quite seeing the bigger picture. The only tool that we had for proving a converse was the traditional entropy power inequality and not a somewhat stronger form. And what we have is now a stronger form where we can consider kind of Markov chains of the form q to x to y to v. And now that's precisely what I need, because what I can do is I can identify the encoding function of x as q, the encoding function of y as g. And when I plug it in there and just rearrange, then I get precisely the converse result for the Gaussian multi-terminal source coding problem. So this is somewhat satisfying from an information theory point of view, because typically for Gaussian problems, what people do is you apply the entropy power inequality, and it gives you the bound that you're looking for. So this problem here was so frustrating for so long because lots of people tried applying entropy power inequality, but it never gave the bound that they're looking for. But it's because you don't have the, the appropriate strengthening. OK, but now it seems like we've discovered the secret sauce. OK, so now this actually turns out to be somewhat surprisingly related to other fundamental inequalities. So OK, I don't want to. Let me just go back to my traditional one like that. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with all of the stuff that's been happening with concentration inequalities, um, so on and so forth. But the inequality originally discovered 
improving Shannon's EPI by Stan. So if we define the so-called entropy power of x equals 1 over 2 pi e, 2 to 2 hx, and then Fisher information, if you're familiar with this, expected where f is a density squared. OK. Then something called the Gaussian log Sobolev with respect to the distribution of x. So this is the density of x, and I put in x there. Yeah. So if anyone's heard of Gaussian log Sobolev inequality, it can be formulated equivalently as in terms of entropy powers and Fisher information greater than or equal to n. OK, where n is the dimension. Well, I'll just use one dimension here. That's fine. Um, OK, so Gaussian log Sobolev inequality. Basically, Gaussian log Sobolev inequality, it implies things like concentration, uh, Talagrand, etc. Basically, a fundamental inequality just in analysis. And the reason why it's so important is because it satisfies uh, some dimension-free property. Just like most of these information theoretic regions, they have this tensorization property. So when I observe independent or IID copies, what I get at the end of the day is the region should just be a function of the original distribution, not of the n-letter distribution. Okay, and so actually what we see is it becomes equivalent to some inequalities in analysis that also enjoy this tensorization property. But anyway, so this was known, STAM, uh, 1959. So Gaussian log subtle of inequality was proved by Gross in 1975. Um, he didn't realize that STAM had proved it earlier in an equivalent form. In fact, it wasn't known that these guys were equivalent until Carlin, 1991. Uh, showed that these guys were equivalent. But basically what we see is we see some duality between some kind of famous inequalities, uh, functional inequalities, and then information theoretic inequalities. And this is not a coincidence. So there's a deep connection between entropies, Fisher informations, and uh, these guys here. OK, so what can we do with this strengthened EPI? So it turns out that this guy can be proved with the original EPI. So maybe what we can do is sharpen these inequalities that uh, are considered quite fundamental. Turns out we can. Okay. So what we can do is we can take that, take uh, z have any distribution such that z x are independent, uh, independent of x and y. And then what we do is we let v equal y plus z over there. And what we find is that 2 to the 2 h x plus w plus h y plus w greater than or equal to 2 to the 2 h x plus h y plus 2 to the 2 h x plus w plus z to, oops. Z to H W. OK, and this looks particularly messy. I agree. It has the same form as entropy power inequality, but it looks a little messy. But what's important here is we're actually getting an upper bound on the entropy of the sum of three random variables. That's somehow very difficult to do. I don't know if anyone's looked at reverse entropy power inequalities. But the fact that you get an upper bound on the entropy of a sum is somewhat unusual. It's pretty hard to control these guys. But what we can do is if I think about rearranging this guy, oops, divide that through what I get is greater than or equal to that, divide by 2 to the 2 hw there, apply epi here, then what happens is it looks like I'm taking a derivative here with respect to the additive noise. So if I let w have noise power T, or maybe I should use uh, okay different T than that T. We'll call it no, not H. Uh, 
I'm running out of things here. S, okay? Then basically, as I take S down to zero, what I'm getting is I'm getting a derivative of this guy in terms of the noise power that I'm adding, right? And so if I take S down to zero, then there's something called De Bruyne's identity, which I can apply, and I get this inequality here, Z, Jx plus J Z greater than or equal to n x plus n z, where n and j are the entropy power and Fisher information that I defined over there. So what actually I end up with at the end of the day is a reverse entropy power inequality. That's quite interesting because, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, this should be z plus w. Excuse me, thanks. Right. OK, so Chandra is paying attention. At least one person is. OK. So what I get is I get this reverse entropy power inequality. And so it's quite special because there's really not any, I don't know, very clean reverse entropy power inequality is known. And that's oftentimes what you need when you're trying to prove some, somewhere, some sort of result is you like to upper bound the entropy of the sum. Uh, in fact, entropy power inequalities have made a lot of, or had a lot of use in like uh, some set uh, theory and stuff because when I add two independent random variables, I can think of basically the convolution of the sets with, of the support of their densities. Anyways, the point is, is that I get an upper bound on this, which is quite unusual, and it's very clean because what it does is it upper bounds it in terms of the marginal entropy powers and Fisher informations of the other guys. It's really quite amazing. Um, so something that you can take now is if I take x, z, i, i, d, then what do I find? When I simplify, I get n, x, j, x is greater than or equal to n, x plus z over root 2 divided by n, x. OK, what is this guy? This is equal to the x of the entropy jump, x, z, over root 2 minus h, x. So there's a big result by, um, who is it, a, b, b, n. What's the a? What's that? No. Um, who is it? A, B, B, N. Barth, Ball, and Maurer. And who is the A? Arnstein. Oh, yeah, yeah, OK. Yeah, it's the way that you're pronouncing it, probably correctly. And me, uh, in my head, was saying it wrong. So what they show is that uh, you know, entropy of normalized sums is monotone increasing, right? So I can think about this guy as kind of like a central limit theorem type of thing. So this is called entropy jump. In fact, you don't need their result to show that it's increasing for just two random variables. But this is the entropy jump. Basically, if I take two independent copies and add them together and normalize by square root two, it's like I get a new random variable with the same variance, right? Um, but hopefully, it should be closer to Gaussian. So if we just define this guy, as, let's just call it dx for the doubling constant um, that's used, then what I see is that I sharpen this inequality that's related to basically equivalent to Gaussian log, Sob or log Sobolev inequality. What I find is that I get the exact same thing over here, but I get a lower bound. This guy is always greater than or equal to 1. Not just of the constant 1, I get it lower bounded by this doubling constant, or in, in terms of entropy jump. So it tells me something about this. So in principle, what we could do now is we could prove refinements of telegram or concentration inequalities for random variables that, that have kind of this large entropy jump type of property. Um, so this is related. There's actually a series of recent papers about log Sobolev inequalities, so-called stability results, where you want to show when equality is almost met with equality. The question is whether any such function should be close to a Gaussian kernel, um, which achieves equality there. And so what they try to do is they try to bound things. So here, this is essentially a stability result, because it says if we're going to attain equality in log Sobolev inequality, we'd have to attain equality here, right, or here, excuse me. But basically what that tells us is that we need to have kind of this doubling constant very close to 1. So this is somewhat surprising because 
quite recently in these papers what they assume in these recent papers typically what they assume to get some sort of stability estimate is they assume that the density of the random variable that they're considering satisfies some uh, Poincare inequality okay so now I'm here at the Institute Henri Poincare and basically they assume that it satisfies some Poincare inequality to get a stability estimate and it's known that if you satisfy a Poincare inequality then in fact the entropy jump is bounded or basically yeah you can bound it away from the minimum one so in fact this is a weaker condition than this Poincare inequality so somehow generalizes um, what's known quite recently and so I find this all to be somewhat beautiful in terms of we start with this kind of operational information theory problem it leads us to some insight that hey what we need is to improve this entropy power inequality in some particular way and then once we do it and we kind of pull back we end up with something just very fundamental at the end of the day that basically improves on these inequalities that are known elsewhere in a way that seems very natural so for instance here this guy is not just lower bounded by something by imposing some regularity conditions it's again lower bounded by something in terms of the distribution right which should be interpreted as how close this guy is to Gaussian because if I can convolve two Gaussians together I'll get another Gaussian this guy will be one um, otherwise it won't so I think I'm like way over time so I didn't even give you any ideas behind the proof that's fine I guess you can look at the paper um, so I guess that's kind of the punchline is that I think that the focus maybe in a lot of these network information theory problems or just information theory problems in general is not that you know we should try to follow this black art of taking some region try to so-called single letterize it um, what we should try to do is identify some equivalent functional inequality that's kind of underlying things uh, okay um, then basically you know there's some duality to information measures and, and try to exploit that and see what happens um, let's see one other thing so Chandra gave a talk he talked about hypercontractivity so Gaussian log Sobolev inequality is also equivalent to hypercontractivity I don't know hypercontractivity certainly is making uh, uh, or being used heavily in TCS right mostly uh, on the hypercube though but here basically the Gaussian log Sobolev inequality is equivalent to hypercontractivity and so what you actually get here is that you could improve or sharpen hypercontractive estimates at least uh, for the Ornstein Uhlenbeck subgroup or semigroup I guess um, here so anyways that's basically it um, I don't know if this was interesting or not but uh, hopefully okay any questions